Oh, welcome. And uh, once again, I apologize for our delayed start. I will briefly introduce uh, those of us who are uh, coordinating the meeting uh, and then our speaker for today, who I'm uh, proud to present. Uh, firstly, let me introduce Tui Mitra, um, my long-term partner in organizing events like this for Grand Rapids and West Michigan. Uh, also, David Langwa, who is uh, not new to data science and analytics West Michigan, um, but maybe new to some of you. Um, David uh, brings a lot of expertise that I personally don't have, and so I'm glad to have him on board. Uh, in particular, he, he has uh, some business and project management and financial experience in the area of IT and uh, the, the business of data analytics that I think will prove very valuable as we search for additional content that will be of value to this community as we go forward. Um, as I always do, um, I like to ask Thomas how to pronounce his last name. Um, Thomas, can you once again uh, humor me and pronounce your last <laughs> yes. name for us? Thomas Geib. Geib. Geib like I. Geib like I. My guy. So Thomas is our <laughs> the guy. Thomas Thomas uh, has been an instrumental in uh, the the technical infrastructure for these online meetings. And let me let me say to all of us that it's not simple. Um, uh, we're we're doing a lot of this these days. But uh, to coordinate a successful online webinar like this uh, actually requires some time and attention. And so I want to thank Thomas and Tuheen for uh, really diving into that and making it happen tonight as on other occasions. Uh, let me begin, let me continue by introducing Colin Prather. Uh, Colin is uh, a recent graduate of the University of San Francisco with a master's in data science. Colin has presented at Big Data Ignite at, and Colin, when was, when was the conference that you presented? Was it 2018? Uh, yes, yes, fall 2018, that's right. Mm -hmm. and, and I recall that on that occasion you presented an introduction to machine learning. I think it was basically machine learning in an hour or something like that. Or <laughs> uh, Do I have that right? That's exactly it. That's exactly what it was. That's right. <laughs> yeah. and, and everyone was astonished by this, uh, this audacious attempt to present machine learning in an hour. Uh, but I think everyone was impressed that you actually did it. Uh, and, and I recall it being rich with examples and code um, and instruction and takeaways. Uh, mm. So I'm really pleased that you've offered to come back and present more. And I'm really intrigued by what you've been doing recently. And perhaps you could take uh, maybe 60 seconds at the beginning of your talk to just bring us up to date on you personally. I know you've spent uh, two years in San Francisco getting uh, more educated. And uh, you've done an interesting internship, which I think is the backdrop for the talk you're giving today. So if you can introduce all that, it'd be great. Um, with that, I, I think I'd like to launch right into the content. Thanks everyone for your patience and Colin, welcome. Thanks so much, Elliot. I'm gonna start with um, sharing my screen here. Oh, that's not it. Here's the presentation here. Okay, so, so please let me know if you're not able to see uh, my slides or, or kind of the, uh, the audio is going in and out um, or anything like that, any of the logistical things. But Elliot, I'm honored um, by, by a really kind introduction. And, and um, as you mentioned, I've been out of the West Michigan area um, for a little over a year now. I um, you know, went to school at Cornerstone University and then moved to San Francisco and um, had been doing a master's in data science. I, I just graduated. And I, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. One of the silver linings um, of this, the whole coronavirus uh, circumstances was that I got to kind of rejoin this data science and analytics uh, West Michigan community uh, with, with these live streams and things. Uh, it's been, been a real treasure to me to, uh, to be back and, and be part of it. I've, I've got to say this community has meant a lot to me. Um, it was largely because of the, the connections I've made here and some of the mentorship that, that I've received that um, I, I think kind of paved a way for me in, in data science. So, so I, I want to start with just a sincere thank you to, uh, to Elliot and to Heen, um, David and Thomas for your, for your work. Uh, I'm, I'm really thankful. And in particular, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to contribute um, tonight on a topic that, that I find really interesting. And uh, whether a baseball fan or not, I, I trust that you will as well. Um, so yeah, so let me begin by just telling you a little bit about um, this project. So essentially tonight, what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through kind of end to end um, my process for, for completing this data science project. Um, this was somewhat of a more experimental and, and research focused uh, data science project. And um, you know, at, at the beginning of this this project, I felt like I had a 
million different ideas for, for ways that I could extend it, that I could improve it, all these different things. And uh, by the end of the project, when, once I'd completed, I, I found that I had even more ideas. Um, so I definitely don't consider this, uh, you know, a totally done and complete and, and wrapped up project. And I hope to kind of uh, call out some of those things uh, throughout the talk, the, the things that I would improve or, or um, yeah, like to enhance uh, perhaps, you know, in the future and with more time. So without further ado, let's, let's dig in here. Uh, so here's kind of an outline uh, for how I see tonight playing out. I want to spend some time uh, in the beginning and just kind of set up the problem, give you some context for uh, exactly the, the data science problem that we're working on here. I'll walk through some of the baseline modeling approaches and how I evaluated those models. And then we'll move into uh, some of the more advanced models that uh, we had landed on, and specifically a deep learning model that blends in some ideas from survival analysis. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to, to share with you how we can apply all these things to uh, MLB data, which I found to be uh, just a lot of fun to work with. So let's start by, by setting up the problem here. So the problem that I, that I wanna walk through with you today is um, a predictive analytic problem where I was tasked with trying to predict the exact at bat at which a starting pitcher in Major League Baseball is gonna be removed from a game. So uh, perhaps for those of you that are not as familiar with, with Major League Baseball, typically you've got one starting pitcher who uh, will begin the game and, and throw maybe the first five, six, seven innings before any of the relief pitchers come in. So um, it's, an, it's an important part of the game whenever that first starting pitcher is going to be removed. And um, having some sort of strategic advantage, being able to know, for example, if you're a major league team, when an opposing starting pitcher is going to be removed, if you can forecast that event, say, two, <clears throat> three, four innings into the future, um, it could enable, for example, one of the, the use cases, if, say, we're able to build uh, a very accurate model could be for making timely substitutions. One example is that if you know a pitcher is going to be removed within the next inning, then perhaps you'll substitute in a um, batter who is maybe not as good at hitting, but might be a better base runner or better in the field. There are certain strategic advantages you could have to knowing those sort of things in the future. Additionally, another use case, say, again, if we're able to build a very accurate model, a useful model would be to yield insights into some proactive strategic decisions that you can make. If, for example, if you're the Detroit Tigers and you're facing the Yankee and the Yankees rather, and Garrett Cole is on the mound, well, you want to try and get him off the mound as quickly as possible. He's one of the best pitchers in the American League. So um, there could perhaps be interpretations of this model that could lead to um, st some strategic insights as well. So I see those as, as kind of the two primary use cases for a model like this. Uh, I do want to give you some caveats about this problem. And frankly, uh, as I was working through this, I, I feel like I could probably spend 60 minutes just talking to you about all the caveats associated. But I just want to underscore uh, two that I, I see as being particularly relevant here. Um, an interesting thing is that uh, a pitcher, a starting pitcher being removed from a game is not something that just kind of organically occurs. No, it's something that uh, a manager makes a decision, a human being makes that, uh, makes that choice. So essentially, with this model, trying to you know predict when the pitcher will be removed, we're modeling the behavior of these MLB managers. What's interesting is that it's been shown empirically and uh, really well. It's 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 well accepted that uh, managers systematically make poor decisions when it comes to removing their starting pitchers. This is uh, less a problem with their maybe their baseball smarts and more just a reality of uh, maybe human psychology. We we tend to have poor intuitions about things and MLB managers are no exception. Uh, so one of the interesting things is, you know, we're trying to, to model the manager's behavior about when they're going to remove their starting pitchers. But we know, you know, people have shown that they, they make sometimes poor and erratic decisions when it comes to making that choice. Another kind of caveat is that not many have, have attempted this problem, you know, in a uh, really valuable starting point for any data science project is kind of seeing what other people have done, those that have that have gone before that have tackled it and not many had for this particular problem. In fact, I'd only seen um, really one, one public project out there where, where people had, had kind of talked about their approaches in, in making these sort of predictions. And it, it was uh, research that came out of Florida State University. It was really well put together. Um, you know, it really, it was essentially was a paper walking through all of their conclusions. And at the very bottom, you, you, you see kind of a, a table of all their results. And it turns out their, their very best model 
out of all the times that a starting pitcher was remo removed from the game, it only got it right about 48% of the time. So if you're familiar with evaluating binary classification models, I'm talking about the model's recall. Um, but realistically speaking here, a model that only gets it right about 50% of the time, it's, it's not going to be that practically useful, certainly not enough to, to move the needle in any sense for, for an MLB team. And on the one time that's or on the one side rather that's that's somewhat um, dejecting, but on the other side it's reasonable, right? There's research out there that's shown that managers just make strange decisions, and and there's nothing uh, uniform about it. Uh, so so on the other hand, it it makes sense. So that's those are some of the the caveats kind of associated with this problem. These things that I knew going into uh, going into my work, which really informed uh, my modeling approaches. Um, finally, there, there's one last kind of kind of weirdness that I, I want to talk about, and that is that in the past few years, say in, in 2018 and in, in 2019, um, the kind of the cries of MLB analysts who have been saying, you know, managers make bad decisions, we need to use data-driven approaches, thing, things of that nature, uh, they, their, their cries kind of started to, to catch wind. And uh, some teams, in particular, some of the more, um, you might say extreme teams uh, ended up taking action, and one of the things that they did, you know, analysts had had shown pretty convincingly that, you know, by the time a starting pitcher gets to face the opposing batters for the third, for the fourth time, the batters start having a lot more success. They start getting more hits, scoring more runs. Uh, it was it, it's a pretty widespread fact. So one of the things that managers began to do <clears throat> is they would take one of their relief pitchers, one of the guys that. Um, you know, maybe doesn't have great endurance, but can do really well for a single inning. And they would have him start the game, actually, you know, face the um, the opposing teams, maybe first, second, third, fourth batters, and then remove him from the game and put in the kind of the real starting pitcher. This way that that pitcher would face the opposing um, batters less times throughout the game, but would also have more of an impact on the later innings, would be able to um, progress a little bit further um, into the game. And so, yeah, this was kind of a strangeness that occurred with the Tampa Bay Rays in 2018 and, and is still kind of um, had some popularity in the big leagues. And the reason that I share this with you, the reason that I, that I even bring this up is because, you know, as data scientists, as data analysts, the context surrounding a modeling objective, it's really important and it, and it should inform our, um, our modeling approaches, you know, and, and knowing all these things, knowing that managers uh, tend to make bad decisions, knowing also that those that have tried this problem before, haven't had much success. One of my, my first um, tasks, you know, when I, when I was facing this problem was scoping it down to a level that uh, it would maybe make it more feasible, a little bit more bite-sized and manageable where I would have a chance at, um, you know, building some sort of useful model, but also scoping it to a level, finding kind of that sweet spot where if I do have success, it could still be practically useful. Um, so that was kind of my, 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 my first task was trying to find that sweet spot and so one of the, the caveats with the data that we used is that we restricted um, it to only using like the headline pitchers. That's the, the term they've kind of coined for the, the true starting pitchers. So our, our model is not even going to look at those, um, those openers that just come in for the first inning and then are removed from the game. So we're, we're totally going to ignore those. Um, another kind of caveat is that uh, we restricted our analysis to only look at uh, teams from the American League. The reason is that Historically, this rule, of course, has changed this year, um, but historically, the American League actually has different rules from the National League regarding whether or not their pitchers hit, and, and sometimes that can have uh, weird implications on when a pitcher is removed from the game. So again, trying to scope down the problem, we totally ignored those. And finally, as we've mentioned, the, um, you know, the way that MLB managers remove their pitchers from the game has been changing a lot over the, the previous years, so we restricted our analysis to only training on data from 2016 to 2018. We didn't, even though the data is there, we didn't pull, you know, from 2007 or even as recent as, as 2014, but just looking at that three year period and then uh, testing actually on the 2019 data. Colin, as you're transitioning uh, slides yeah. here, I will make the comment that if anyone has questions for Colin, please feel free to enter them into the Slack channel or the chat on YouTube Live, and David or Thomas will interject those into the conversation um, whenever there seems to be an appropriate break. Thank you, Tom, Colin, and please continue. Yeah, please do. That'd be that'd be great. And in fact, the, the fact that there seems to be none yet that's that's probably a good thing. You know, I'm excited to get through. Uh, some of the setup and in, into the meat, probably what, what you're all more interested in. 
Um, but moving forward, uh, you know, now that we, we've talked through um, the problem that, that we're trying to solve, right? We're trying to predict the exact at bat at which um, a starting pitcher is removed from the game. So essentially, you can think of this as a binary classification problem where uh, for each at bat, we're predicting a one for if the pitcher was, you know, we're predicting that he's going to be removed from the game or a zero if he's not. We want to predict some probability of the removal after each at bat. Knowing that, one of the things we, you know, we have to do and once we have the raw data preparing it um, into a format that's more amenable to a, a statistical a predictive model is we have to engineer some features, some, some variables that we think might be useful in, um, in predictive of whether or not a pitcher will be removed from the game. And what I've done here, I'll, I'll show a, maybe a list of all the features that I've used. There's 17 in total. It might be overwhelming. I, I don't expect you to kind of read, read exhaustively through the whole list. But what I will tell you is that there is uh, nothing too fancy going on here. I'm, I'm sure if you were to take a moment or two and jot down some ideas for some variables you might think would be useful in predicting when a picture will be removed, uh, you'll probably get most of them here. One of the interesting things, and, and I do want to share this piece, is that when I started thinking about engineering features for this problem, I was digging really deeply into a lot of the um, more recent, more advanced pitching metrics. There's a ton of them out here. Baseball, baseball stat heads are are pretty incredible in that in that um, yeah in that manner. Um, so I was you know digging deeply into these more advanced statistics, and some of the advice that I had gotten was that realistically, a lot of these metrics are all calculated from the same you know handful of raw stats. Uh, you know, a lot of the advanced pitching metrics are only calculated off how many pitches someone's thrown, how many innings, you know, they've lasted, uh, how many bases they've let up, things like that. And so as opposed to using some of those advanced um, metrics, why not just use the raw values in your model? And it turns out, of, of course, they're highly correlated with those more advanced um, metrics. So it, it allowed me to um, not introduce any extra complexity into kind of my data pipeline than was needed. Um, so that was, yeah, kind of a neat, um, a neat lesson there for me uh, from the feature engineering components. So that's, that's kind of it for setting up the problem. If there's any uh, pertinent questions on that or anything that I've, that I've totally, um, you know, missed, please, please bring those up in the Slack channel and I'd, I'd be happy to, to talk through some of those things. A quick drink of water here. I got a question for you. Uh, how long have, have you been working on this project or how long did it take you in total to get this project completed? That's a great question. Uh, I would say this this project is somewhat well developed. Um, I was probably working on it for about a six month period. Um, I will say uh, an, an annoying amount of time was spent on on the data processing and, and data pipeline components. I'm, uh, I'm I'm happy to to dig more into that perhaps at the end if we have some questions. But about six months would would be the answer. It doesn't look like we have any other questions right now. All right, great. Let's uh, let's keep moving forward then. So I, I want to talk to you about um, some of the baseline models that that I um, initially fit. So when I was starting this problem, even before I had a real good idea about um, you know what a good model would look like, I, I just wanted to fit some baseline models to to at least give myself some context for um, a model that, for you know what the simplest of models could achieve and then how I could improve on those things um, moving forward. So the, the first model that I fit was a simple logistic regression model. And as I mentioned, this is kind of a binary classification problem, predicting uh, the probability of pitcher removal after each at bat. And a, a good way to kind of evaluate binary classifiers is using something called a confusion matrix. Uh, if you haven't worked with, a, with one of these before, I will admit these can be somewhat confusing at times. Um, but let me walk let me walk you through exactly kind of how to read this this table here and um, and that'll help us as we evaluate some some models throughout the presentation so we've got this table or this matrix here maybe I, I can draw your attention just to the top row here so what this top row is is telling us is both of these numbers add up to the total number of times in our test data set the total number of at bats where the pitcher stayed in the game. And it's broken up in the, the green box. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here. In the, in the green box, we have the total number of times in the test set the pitcher stayed in the game and the model got it right. And in the red box, these are all the times the model got it wrong. So if we just look at that top row, you know, you might think, wow, the, the model got nearly 45,000 of the at-bats at bat, at 
correct when the pitcher stayed in the game and only 209 incorrect. It seems like it's doing a really good job for simple logistic regression. And if you're looking just at the top row, that would be right. But now I, I want to direct your attention to the bottom row here. And in the bottom row, um, the, the two numbers there, they, they sum up to the total number of times that in our test set that the pitcher was removed from the game, all the at-bats. And as you'll see here, um, nearly 2,000 times in total, and the model gets most of them wrong. So kind of what we can, uh, you know, one way we could summarize this is, is, well, it looks like the logistic regression model is basically just predicting that the pitcher is going to be, um, it rather is going to stay in after after every at bat, and this is reasonable. Uh, in our data set, we see that there's far more far more observations when the pitcher stays in the game. And one way that we can summarize this whole confusion matrix is basically with this F1 score of uh, 0.32. I won't get into the details here, but it's um, a kind of mean of the uh, precision and recall. And this F1 score ranges from zero to one, so a value of 0.32. Um, is, is not so good of a model and, again, is not going to move the needle in any practical sense for a big league team. Moving on with, with the baseline models, I also went for a gradient boosted tree classifier. And as far as uh, model complexity goes, this is quite a, quite a bit more complex than a simple logistic regression classifier. Um, but again, we can, we can summarize its, its outputs and its behavior with the same confusion matrix. And what we see here, again, we can read kind of row by row, we see essentially the same story that um, even the more complex um, gradient boosted tree, which is you know designed to do really well on um, tabular data, has the same problem, is, is pretty much just predicting that the pitcher stayed in after every at bat, which again is, is a reasonable thing and um, maybe inclines us to, to think a little bit more about some alternative modeling approaches that we might have more success with. And you know the F the F1 score well, we see there is 0.39, which is a little bit of an improvement over the logistic regression model. Um, however, it, it's still significantly below even the, the stats reported in that one paper from, uh, from Florida State. Their their best model got an F1 score of 0.53. So we're still significantly um, below that, and and we don't have a model that's going to be helpful in any in any real sense. And, Colin, we got a we got a question sure. here from Michael just a couple minutes ago. He wants to know: sure. Can the model predict beyond the at bat that is starting, or is it just making a prediction after each at bat? That's a great question. Yeah, I'm happy to clarify. It is just predicting after that at bat, so we're not doing any forecasting into the future at this point. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. To be totally explicit, I, I want to dig into exactly how these models. Are making their predictions. So let me kind of explain what I have here. On the left-hand side, I have an abbreviated subset of our data. So again, there were 17 features initially, but here I'm only showing four just for the sake of example. And then on the right-hand side, I have um, kind of what the model's predictions may look like. So the way, the way that these models, both the logistic regression and the gradient boosted tree classifiers, the way it'll work is it'll look at um, a single row of features. Basically, it's going to look at the features associated with that first at bat, and, it, and then it's going to make a prediction. It's going to predict that probability of removal. Presumably, after um, the first at bat, the probability of being removed would be very low. Um, so this is kind of how we would make predictions about a novel game, uh, uh, you know, if we're trying to do some sort of inference. After, say, the second at bat, the way this model would, uh, would make predictions is it would look at that row just at that second at bat. And then it would, it would try and make a prediction. In other words, it would totally disregard whatever happened in the first at bat. It would look at the features from the second at bat and try and make those predictions. And uh, it would basically continue to do this throughout the entire game, just looking at that single uh, feature you know, from, that, from that single at bat and then uh, try to make predictions there. So essentially, the assumption baked into this model is that each of the at bats throughout a game, they're totally independent from one another. They're not being taken into account when making a prediction about an at-bat later in the game. Uh, now, one thing you might say is, well, Colin, it looks like you're using features that are, um, that are carrying some of that time information throughout the game. For example, uh, runs allowed and bases allowed, these are kind of cumulative sums that are, that are being aggregated throughout the game. And on the one hand, you're right. Uh, that, that's totally correct. And this was um, kind of a, a, a problem that I was thinking through and attention that, that I worked through throughout the problem. Um, but one of the conclusions that I came to was that this was 
this assumption of independence between the abats was the key issue with um, with these models. It's why they weren't performing uh, nearly where where we would need or want them to be at. And so to kind of uh, expound on the shortcoming of these models, uh, I want to show you another example, again, to be, to be totally explicit. And so the way that I want to kind of uh, convey this message is, is I'm going to show you kind of two alternative data sets. On the left-hand side, I'll, I'll kind of explain here. Again, we, we have this data set, and I've abbreviated even further. So in the real model, there were 17 features here. I'm only showing two of them just for the sake of example. You'll also notice that I kind of cherry-picked individual rows. It jumps from the first at bat to the third to the eighth. And, and so on. Uh, those at bats still exist in the game. I, I just have chosen not to show them here. So, but uh, most importantly, what you'll see is that for this start, for this individual pitcher outing, the pitcher lasted 22 batters, pitched for 22 at bats, and he allowed five runs at the end of the game. An alternative way that this game could have played out, as you'll notice here on the right hand side, you know, we have the same thing going on with, with the, the pitcher on the right-hand side that faced 22 batters, allowed five runs. But you'll notice that the way that they allowed runs is totally different. On the left-hand side, they kind of gradually let up one run, then two, then, then three, then four. It was very gradual throughout the game. But on the right-hand side, the pitcher uh, let up no runs until the 17th at bat. And then uh, at that point, the wheels kind of came off, and, and by the 22nd, he had he'd allowed five runs. So the bottom row from these two data sets is exactly the same, 22nd at bats, five runs allowed, um, but the, their kind of behavior throughout the game is totally different. Now, my contention is that the model's predictions, I think, should, should be different uh, within these games, but the models that are um, carrying this, this assumption of independence between the at bats, they're, they're not picking up on the uh, the nuances between these these two data sets, and since we're using deterministic models, they would have the exact same prediction. So that's kind of um, the main problem that is um, that 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 really that I had to solve when when doing this this modeling task. So knowing knowing this problem, knowing this issue of independence, I think it's helpful for us to think about okay, if we could have everything exactly the way that we wanted it, if we could have a model that that uses kind of information from previous at bats. How would that work? So let's um, let's maybe just do some brainstorming, even if you know just a thought exercise. Let's think through exactly how we would want this to work. So ideally, if we're making predictions on an on an at bat, you know, say the the first at bat comes up, well, it's reasonable. Our model can just look at uh, the features calculated from that first at bat and make some sort of prediction, essentially the same exact way that some of those those other baseline models did. However, when we, oh, do we, do we have a, another question there? Uh, doesn't look like we do right, right yet, but I'll let you know when we get another. Okay, sweet, sweet, false start. Um, no, but moving forward here, okay, so, you know, if the, the ideal model for us, when we make predictions on the first at bat, it would, um, you know, it would just look at those features and then make a prediction. However, when we moved on to that second at bat, our ideal model, we would want to take into account the features that were calculated in the first at bat and the second bat and use those uh, to, to make the prediction about if the pitcher is going to be removed after that second at bat. And even moving forward, when, when we come to the third at bat, oops, I, I hit the wrong arrow there. When we come to the third at bat, uh, you'll have to forgive me, folks, for, for the use of the arrows. I was just wrestling with trying to get them to, uh, to you know, to kind of convey the message here. I hope you can, you can see it. I wasn't too happy with it. But um, you know, when we, when we come to the third at bat, our hope is that our model would be able to take into account uh, the features from, from the third, the second, and the first at bats in making that prediction. We want the, um, the, the time dependent nature of this data to be appropriately modeled. The sequential uh, way that a game kind of unfolds should be mirrored in the way that we're modeling the data. So, what we'll do here is it, allow me to try to introduce just a little bit of of mathematical formulation to, uh, I, I think, provide us a foundation to talk about how we're going to do, do some of the modeling here. So we can think of these models' predictions now. They're not just predicted probabilities. Now, by and large, they're actually um, conditional probabilities. So let me walk you through kind of the, the change that I've made um, on this slide here. Imagine that th this um, column of models' predictions Let's call it H, and, and the reason I'm, I'm using H, traditionally it's called Y if you're 
uh, used to machine learning or Y hat or something like that. But let's call it H. I think the reason for that choice in notation will become clear in a couple slides. Um, and so if this column is H, then H sub one would be, uh, would be the first value there. So the predicted probability after the first at bat would just be the, the probability that H1 is equal to one, the probability that the pitcher is removed after the first, first at bat. Moving forward, model's prediction at the second at bat would then be, I'm reading this row right here, it's the probability that the pitcher was removed after the second at bat conditioned on the fact that he was not removed after the first at bat. So eight, eight, the probability H2 is equal to one is, is that the pitcher was removed at the second at bat conditioned on the fact, assuming that he was not removed after the first at bat. And even as we, as we move to the third at bat, the model's output then would be uh, the probability that the pitcher is removed after the third at bat conditioned on the fact he was not removed in the second at bat and not removed in the first at bat. So the key point here is we're no longer uh, predicting just probabilities. Um, we're, you know, overall, we're predicting conditional probabilities um, throughout each at bat at each time step. And, and so that kind of wraps up um, some of our baseline models and, and some of the, the shortcomings there with the baseline models. And, and you know, I, the last couple of slides there, we're talking about exactly what kind of model we would want. So um, if there's any questions there, I'm, I'm happy to uh, provide some explanation, but if not, I'll move on to, uh, to the more advanced modeling approaches here. Typically with these streams, uh, people won't see uh, what you're saying to a couple seconds after, usually 10, 15 seconds. So we'll just see if any, any come in and uh, I sure. can, I'll just interrupt if, if any do. Perfect. Okay, great to know. Okay, so essentially um, what I was getting at in the last slide is that we want to have a model that takes into account the time dependent nature of the data. On the one hand, you, you could start with um, some some time series approaches, and, and those could work well. But given the context of this problem, given how noisy we know that the data is, uh, one of the things we ended up doing was was going uh, straight for a recurrent neural network. And um, and so I have a diagram here to kind of explain at a high level how a recurrent neural network works. Um, I should note this diagram comes from a blog written by Chris Ola. The link there is at the bottom. Uh, just to, as an aside, it, it's it's a great blog post. It was written in 2015, um, and I mean, in deep given given the amount of advancement that's that there has been in deep learning over the past five years, that is like an eternity ago. But uh, but it's still pretty much the most prominent blog on on recurrent ne neural networks and and LSTMs in particular. So I, I would highly recommend the blog if this is something that you're interested in. All right, Colin, we got a couple questions rolling in now. So great. one is uh, Tom wants to know. What software used to develop those models? Good question. Uh, for the baseline models, I was working in Scikit-Learn using their logistic regression and gradient boosted tree classifier. And uh, for the recurrent neural network, I was working in PyTorch. Okay, and then Michael has got another one here. He wants to know, mm -hmm. what an approach to incorporating the time dependent dependence be features that are time derivatives? And then he elaborates how many runs in the last at bat or less few at bats. Mm. Well, like a re like relative time uh, dependent features. Yeah, that, that's a great, um, yeah, a, a really great idea. Um, yeah, it wasn't something that, that we did um, particularly in this project, but but again, it is one of those many ideas, I think ways that this project could uh, could be extended and, and things. I guess my, my initial thought is my hope that the uh, recurrent neural network can pick up some of those those relative uh, time dependent features uh, organically or, or naturally, but that, that could be a, a simplified way to kind of feed those features into the model. So that's a great idea. All right. And then uh, we got Julian asking, is time a consideration with the ratio of features? Is time a consideration with the ratio of features? He says, I feel like those could be noisy in the first few innings. I think he's asking like, does time play a factor in, uh, the the formula, like how long it takes the person to get up and bat and and other other factors of time? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, one, one of the um, features we're using is the pitcher strike to ball ratio. So if he walks the first, um, <laughs> you're right, the first batter of the game, then his, it's, it's zero essentially uh, and totally noisy. 
Um, so yeah, it wasn't something that we directly kind of accounted for in the model. Um, again, again, I guess ideally something the model would pick up, but that's a good point. Something to, to be aware of. Yeah, there, there's definitely um, some in, like added uh, noisiness, I would say, in the beginning of the game. Awesome. All right, and that that looks like it would be all for now. Great. Okay, so um, so I'll get right to it here. The the model that we decided was going to be most appropriate. Uh, for this problem was going to be a recurrent neural network and specifically the way that an RNN would take into account the time dependent nature. So this is kind of a, a diagram that I think can do a good job of explaining how recurrent neural networks. Um, so you'd imagine at the bottom of this diagram, we, we start with x0, x1, and x2 and so forth. We can think of those as the feature vector associated with each at bat. Additionally, A we can think of as our model. So uh, at the first time step, we're feeding in our feature vector associated with the first at bat. And there's two outputs. The first output goes vertical, and that's h sub zero. That would be like the predicted probability the picture was removed after the first at bat. The other output goes horizontally to the right, and it's kind of fed back in to the model. And at that second time step, there's two inputs. There's the model's output from the first time step and also the feature vector from the second time step. So essentially this model uh, at any time step, it's taking into account uh, the previous model's output from the previous time step and the feature vector from that time step. Um, so this is kind of how a recurrent neural net works. Again, I'm not, I'm not gonna get um, too deep into the weeds, but I would, I would certainly recommend uh, the, the blog post there that, that's linked at the bottom. If we wanna zoom in on this model uh, in particular, again, this is just highlighting the fact that for at any particular time step, the model is taking two in inputs. It's the model's output from the previous time step and the features associated with um, the given at bat. So, so this, this is an important piece and, and this is the way that the recurrent neural net takes into account uh, the time dependent aspect is, is it has those, those two outputs at any given moment. Um, one of the, the primary problems with a recurrent neural net um, that's, that's kind of well documented is this issue that it, oftentimes it can have difficulty um, picking up on long-term dependencies, say if there was an event that was recorded in the feature vector uh, in, a, in an early at bat that was then relevant for making a prediction at a later at bat. If there's a long distance between those two at bats, it can be difficult for the model to, uh, to pick up on those, those long-term dependencies. And so in order to kind of counteract this, um, this trait of a recurrent neural net, specifically the model that I'm using is a long short-term memory network uh, commonly referred to as an LSTM. Again, zooming in here, there's, there's a lot going on within this model and I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, piecing apart all of the details, but, but the most important piece, the piece that I wanna highlight is that within this, this LSTM network, now there's actually three inputs coming into this cell. There's the feature vector, the model's predictions from the last, um, at bat or the last time step and there's also it, it's labeled here as c c sub t or t minus one there uh, it's kind of the context of of the model and and the important piece here is that this this um context is being passed through from time step to time step and it's only on undergoing some kind of simple linear transformations that's what this multiplication sign and the addition sign there um, the important piece is that there's nothing non-linear and so th this context can be okay sweet all right hello everyone we're, we're back um and so the main idea here again we're using this recurrent neural network we're using it to pick up the time dependent natures in the data um and in particular we're using an lstm to try to encourage some some uh of the keeping in mind some of the long -term dependencies from say the beginning of game to the end of the game this is uh, kind of the point I, I was trying to get at when talking about um the, uh, the some of the um, shortcomings of the baseline models. Uh, so, so that's where we are with, with the LSTMs. So this was um, the deep learning approach that I was taking in. In, in particular, I wanted to, to blend this with some ideas from survival analysis. Now, I, I want to give you a short introduction to survival analysis, and then I want to tie together exactly how uh, this will connect with our, our deep learning, our LSTM model. Now, survival analysis is a flavor of statistics that's um, really designed to do time to event modeling. So it has deep foundations in, uh, for example, clinical trials in healthcare. 
Um, statisticians will use survival analysis uh, techniques to try to do things like uh, predict literally how long people will survive if they've taken a certain medication or uh, the amount of time that will pass until a, a certain event of interest takes place. So, so this is kind of the, the framework that, um, that survival analysis lends itself to. Um, and specifically, one, one of the trademarks of survival analysis is that it enables statisticians to, to train and fit models using what they would call both censored and uncensored data. Now, uncensored data would kind of be defined as a, an observation where we know exactly when the event of interest is going to take place. Um, so survival analysis, it's all about time to event modeling. Uh, a trademark is you can use both censored and uncensored data. Um, censored data would be defined as when uh, you maybe know information about uh, a given individual, say in a clinical trial, but you don't know exactly when that um, event actually took place. Uh, that sounds sounds kind of counterintuitive, but this could occur, for example, if um, you're doing a clinical trial to measure, you know, when somebody perhaps uh, has cancer and the clinical trial ends before, before they do get cancer. So that's the, those are some examples there and kind of an overview of the field of survival analysis. Now, um, I do have to talk a little bit about some of the math in uh, particular because that's the way that we're going to tie it in to our deep learning approach. So in survival analysis, uh, there's often a, a variable that's thrown around that's referred to as Z, which uh, represents the actual time that an event of interest takes place. So for example, if um, you say you know that in, uh, somebody in a clinical trial has a heart attack in 23 days, maybe you know, you're retrospectively looking from time step zero, 23 days later, they have a heart attack, you would say that the actual time of event Z is equal to 23. So, uh, so we're going to kind of carry this, this information with us about survival analysis. And I want to talk specifically about two quantities that pop up often in survival analysis that are, uh, that are really kind of the, the bread and butter for survival analysis. This is what survival analysis is interested in. The first is what's referred to as the conditional hazard rate, which is a function. And it's a function of um, a point in time. So the conditional hazard rate gives you the probability that the event of interest Z is equal to that uh, that point in time. So you'd say, you know, the probability that an event Z occurs at time point T, which might be 23 or, or what have you. And then specifically, it's conditioned on the fact that Z, I have written that Z is greater than T minus one, or more generally, that the event has not occurred in the past. So it's the, the generally speaking, it's the probability that an event occurs at a specific time step conditioned on the fact that it has not occurred in the past. Um, now, if, if you've been able to, uh, to pay attention throughout some of our technical difficulties, my hope is that that would be, uh, that would kind of strike, strike a bell in your, in your memory, because remember, this is exactly what the outputs of our ideal model would be. This, this is exactly what the outputs of our uh, LSTM model at every time step is. It's the probability that the picture is going to be removed if the ev our event of interest is at that specific time step conditioned on the fact that it has not occurred in previous time steps. So, so this is important. This is probably the, the crux of, of the presentation. This is how we tie in our deep learning model to our survival analysis framework is that our LSTM is modeling the conditional hazard rate of a picture being removed at each time step. Finally, there, there's one more quantity I want to kind of bring to your attention, and, and that's referred to as the survival function. And again, it's a function of time and, and um, the survival function gives you the probability that the event of interest um, occurs at some time point in the future. So a lot of times this is uh, directed at the uh, censored data, but the survival function just is just giving you the probability that the event hasn't occurred yet and it doesn't occur now. It's just going to occur sometime in the future. And in particular, it, it's um, calculated based off of the hazard rate. So uh, we're modeling the hazard rate with the LSTM and we're going to use that those you know, the estimated hazard rate to calculate the survival function. Um, so that's, that's essentially the, the connection between our uh, LSTM and the, the survival analysis framework that we're interested in. And now, now I want to give you a little look into what the outputs of this DRSA model, I have that acronym at the top, stands for Deep Recurrent Survival Analysis Model, what it, what it its outputs look like. Again, um, at each time step, it's the conditional hazard rate. And so I want to show you what it looks like for 
a, a particular pitcher outing for a particular instance. This is uh, the game that Matthew Boyd, a pitcher for the Tigers, threw at Cleveland on uh, July 18th of 2019. The outputs of this model, this model, remember the, the probability that pitchers removed conditioned on the fact that he hasn't been removed in previous at bats. Uh, it looks like an incredibly low probability on left. I'm looking at the graph on the left hand side with the at bat number on the x axis and the predicted probability on the y axis. Uh, for the, the majority of the first at bats, from, you know, the first through 10 through even through really the 19th batter that he faced, the, pr the probability of being removed was very low. And it's not until the, the 24th batter that um, the prediction spikes a little bit. And one thing you might notice is that, uh, well, a predicted probability of, of it looks like 0 0.43 doesn't seem uh, to be that high of a probability. And, and the one thing I would say here is that th this is a problem where had to do some tuning of the probability threshold that, that I was making predictions at. And in particular, a threshold of 0 0.3 tended to do a good job of, of distinguishing the at-bats that the pitcher was removed versus when he was not. Now, that's the direct output, the graph on the left-hand side, that conditional hazard rate. On the right-hand side, um, I'm calculating the estimated survival rate based on this graph on the left-hand side. Now, now for uh, an MLB manager and an MLB analyst, this can also be useful because it's giving us at each time step, after each at bat, our model is estimating the survival rate, the probability that the pitcher, excuse me, is gonna be, is gonna keep pitching and just be removed at some point in the future. So um, essentially for the first 21, 22 at bats or so, it's, it's just linearly dropping this probability that I'll be pulled at some point um, in the future until finally the survival rate drops a lot around to 0.3 when the pitcher uh, Matthew Boyd is is removed from the game there. Um, just for, for sake of another example, I have these same plots, the models predictions uh, for when Garrett Cole was uh, was pitching at Boston in you know May 17th of 2019. And uh, the charts though, Cole pitched uh, against fewer batters, 22 here instead of 24 from Matthew Boyd previously, uh, the charts look almost exactly the same. The, the shape of the distributions look very similar here. Um, and so as far as timing wise here, I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to end here and, and kind of pause for questions. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to field any questions that, that you have from here. Okay. I think we got a couple ones that they wanted to save to the end because they're a bit longer. But I did see one in between that. Uh, here it is. Sure. Mike wanted to know, is there redundancy between the model having memory uh, feeds itself and the feature vector having cumulative data, total number of pitches, runs, et cetera? Mm. Great question. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're getting to the heart of it there. Um, I think totally. I, I think there's certainly um, like that, that aspect is in play here. Um, in the end, it was, it was the approach that we decided to take, we felt like the, the performance of the model was was kind of where we wanted it to be. But I would be interested, actually, now that you bring that up, if, if we used kind of no cumulative features, if we just used the raw, basically, indicators for a lot of, a lot of our variables, um, how that would kind of fare with, if we just, you know, essentially rely on the LSTM to have the memory to, um, to identify those long-term dependencies. That's an, an interesting idea and definitely a way that this project can be extended. Awesome. And uh, Michael here, he wanted to say this one to the end. He wants to know, mm -hmm. do you think this model could be used by less experienced managers to help them decide when to pull a pitcher? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think, yeah, for, first of all, right, like, like we're digging, we're digging through all this. We're, we're talking about LSTMs and, and all these different things. And um, that probably wouldn't be my pitch if I were, if I were bringing this to an MLB executive more, um, probably more accessible would actually be uh, these charts here. I do think that it, it could be something useful. Um, one of the interesting things I, I didn't get the chance to talk about was that um, I did train um, specific uh, pitcher embeddings associated with, with each pitcher. So, uh, and I'm happy to talk more about that, but this model makes uh, predictions that are um, specific to each individual pitcher. I'm taking it into account um, basically the, uh, the characteristics of each pitcher in this model. And I do think that just looking at a graph like this survival rate on the right hand side, it could be helpful to a manager to know, um, you know, if you look at say the 12th at bat here, he can just look at that graph and say, okay, there's still about an 85% chance the pitcher is going to survive this at bat, or it's just, 
um, can provide a, uh, a high level summary of what's going on with the model. And I think some of these um, higher level uh, ideas would, would probably be more useful in a practical sense uh, to, to an MLB executive. All right. Uh, Julian's got a kind of hypothetical question. Uh, mm -hmm. He's asking, he's kind of curious about the scenario if, say, in the future, uh, MLB teams start using technology to pull their pitchers. What would happen if, uh, say, they're competing head to head and they're using data? Uh, and it says, you know, with the current data, they're probably going to think we're going to pull the pitcher. So instead, let's not. Do you think this is going <laughs> to affect the actual sport itself? Uh, like change the you know the way it's played almost or what are your thoughts on that <laughs> like a, like a data arms race uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know what what I would say is that I think in large part that's already happening um, gosh if you if you watch a baseball game nowadays you're seeing things like like the Tampa Bay Rays in 2018 they introduced this idea of an opener where they had a guy, uh, you know, come in and just face the first, like so in some cases, just the leadoff hitter or the first couple batters, which is what, I mean, the game of baseball is changing. They're having to implement new, one of the new rules this year was that a uh, pitcher coming in has to face at least three, three batters. They couldn't have, you know, a pitcher, they can't just bring in a pitcher for a single at bat. You're, I mean, um, it, I mean, it, it's, it's impacting all aspects of the game with, with all the analytics that there is now you're seeing in many cases, there's like three or four, even infielders all on the right hand side of second base like it, for a left-handed batter that that pulls the ball um there, there's great shifts going on and and so uh, it's honestly to answer that I, I think that this the analytics craze has has already changed the game and and we see some uh rule changes actually now being implemented in the mlb that are kind of in some sense lagging behind so i, I would say the, the game is being changed by this yeah okay yeah i don't follow mlb too closely so that's interesting to know uh, another question uh, from Michael: Could the hazard rate ever go down? Oh, I'm so glad! I'm so glad you asked that. Um, personally, I would think yes. I would think, I would think, yeah, it's got to. One of the um, man, one of the great um, the, the the great benefits of using this model, using an LSTM to model the conditional hazard rate is that there's no distributional assumptions about what the hazard rate looks like. Typically, in traditional survival analysis, you have some assumed distribution for what the hazard rate looks like, and you use data to estimate those parameters. In this case, we're not doing that. So even though this hazard rate looks pretty uh, like a pretty smooth line, if we were to, if we were to you know, smoothen that out, I would say it doesn't have to be. And here's the example I keep coming back to. You know, I, I think about a pitcher who, let's say in the fifth inning, He's facing the 14th batter and he's in like a real pinch, you know, bases are loaded. It's a tie game. The, the manager's thinking, Oh, you know, maybe I should take him out. I would imagine in that scenario, this conditional hazard rate might jump up a little bit, but if the pitcher squeezes himself out of the pinch and then say has a really smooth, uh, sixth and seventh inning there for it, I would imagine this conditional hazard rate would, um, would move back down. I'll, I'll be honest. Unfortunately, uh, empirically, I, I, I didn't see any examples of this, but man, I really wanted it to happen in my, in my mind. It makes sense. And, and that's, I'm glad you bring that up because that's, um, that's a really good question. Excellent. So, uh, next one here we got is, uh, Andrew, how did you go about featuring or about feature engineering? Did you use an iterative approach? Good question. Yes, it was iterative. Um, yeah, there was, you know, there's 17 features used in the model. There was probably 30 or 40 candidate features. Um, I spoke a little bit about how initially my focus was very much on uh, some of those advanced pitching uh, statistics, but kind of realized a lot of them are calculated from the same four or five um, raw features. But honestly, here, practically, here are a couple things that I did. First, I looked at um, some of the, the importance of the features on the more baseline models. So I looked use some feature importance techniques um, and even fit some kind of simpler decision trees to look at what kind of features uh, the model identified as, as the most important ones to split on. So those are, that was kind of my approach and those were two kind of automated uh, feature um, identification uh, techniques I used. Okay, and then Andrew just asked this uh, right as you were answering that, what was the performance F1 score uh, confusion matrix of the final model? Great question. Great question. I didn't get to that, but here's, 
for the for the DRSA model, the deep recurrent survival analysis. Here's the confusion matrix and the F1 score. Um, so you can take a quick look at that, but I'll, I'll give you a summary. So um, my baseline model has received an F1 score around 0.31, 0 0.39, 0 uh, not, not really anything improving out of what was out there. Uh, in the paper, they reported an F1 score around 0 0.53, and, and this model made significant improvements using um, the deep recurrent survival analysis technique, and um, it's, it's a much better looking confusion matrix there. So I would say, I mentioned at the beginning, this was um, somewhat of an experimental and more R&D focused project. Um, personally, I, I think there's a lot more validating in, in things to do there, so I'm, I'm not I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm shouting this off, off the rooftops. I, I think there's still some work to be done there, um, but I was really happy with, with the performance of the model. Awesome. And uh, another Thomas here, he wants to know, is the purpose of this model for a prediction or inference? You seem to focus on the predictive side, but what do you have to say about the features matter? Hmm. Good question. Yeah, for us as uh, you know, you know, congregating here, we're a lot of data scientists who are probably very interested in the prediction and the, the confusion matrix. But um, what's really important here, honestly, to me, I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of taking this in a different direction. I see is the interpretations of the model. Um, I, I don't know any MLB managers personally, but my guess would be that uh, they don't care much about the confusion matrix, or maybe even not that much about um, the the survival rate chart. But what they want to know is how can they get a, a good starting pitcher off the mound, or what are strategic moves that they can do to, um, you know, that that they can use this information practically in the game. This is one of the the ways that I would love to extend this project is is digging into um, individually for each of the pitchers in the big leagues. What are uh, little tweaks, little nuances that a team can do to uh, say get them out of the game sooner, or if it's a pitcher they like, maybe leave them in the game longer, um, having an an impact on things like that, I think, is the should be the biggest focus here in a way that um, I would I would love to extend the project. And I yeah, I have some ideas about that. I wasn't able to extend any of them or implement them too too seriously. Okay, and it looks like we got one last one. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually say that, and then five more come in. But Mike <laughs> wants to know: given the success <laughs> F one score, do you think you would be able to loosen some of your assumptions now? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, short answer is yes, I do. I, um, you know, I, I talked about some of the some of the data caveats and the way we were totally ignoring the the openers and only looking at pictures from the AL and things like that. Um, after we we trained this model, I, I did do some, um, yeah, some experimenting. Was I, I was making predictions on say playoff games where where the pitcher removal. Um, dynamics might look a little bit different and even you know from the national league and the model still seemed to hold it seemed to generalize pretty well so it would be interesting to go back and loosen some of those assumptions and um yeah and, and see how the model performs okay i actually just saw another one by stevie um he says sorry i got here late did your speaker say anything or say what the feature vector is driving the neural network also, is the network mm -hmm. presented a sequence of pitches or a sequence of at-bats? Yeah, good question. You know what? I will um, I'll move back to this uh, table here with all of the features. Let's see, but um, whoops, a little bit further back here. There we go. Uh, so these are all, there are 17 features in total. This is a list of all of them with, with a short description. Um, basically features that are um, aggregating the, the pitcher's performance throughout the game. And, um, and yeah, this is an, an important piece that we were making predictions at the at-bat level, meaning it was not individual pitches it was that were being fed into the model. It was aggregate statistics from each at-bat. Uh, this is where a lot of the complexity came into um, our data pipeline because um, you know the, the MLB provides an, a comprehensive amount of publicly available data. There's clean APIs. It's, it's fantastic. But unfortunate for me, there was no like... Um, for you, you know, data analysts out there, there is no like unique identifier for each individual at bat. So I couldn't just group by at bat and aggregate these stats. I had to use kind of some um, some context from within the, each at bat to figure out when one ended and when the next began. And there was a lot of edge cases there. Um, so that's a little summary about the, the data pipeline. But but yeah, it was just the um, features were fed in the model at the at bat level. 
Okay, I think that catches us all up. Great, awesome. <laughs> Colin, I want to break in here and uh, recognize a couple things. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is your, your fearless uh, incorporation of mathematics into your talk, and I appreciate that. And, and, I, and I think everyone who's listening does too. Often uh, speakers have some reluctance to uh, venture into mathematical or statistical or probability. And uh, it's refreshing that you do, and you also explain it well. And so thanks for, for making it robust um, and detailed in that regard. I want to ask you, I know you haven't had time, of course, to monitor the Slack channel, but there there have been a lot of questions via mm -hmm. Slack and some questions via the YouTube line. And I'd like to ask you to monitor those yeah. channels and particularly the Slack channel for the next uh, perhaps 24 hours in case there is follow-up conversation. Sure. Uh, what I've noticed in the course of this is that there have been uh, a lot of questions. And whenever that, that is the case, I know it's been a great talk. So I haven't asked a single question, and that means this has been a great talk. Uh, so thanks for, for presenting again to this group as you have in the past. Uh, I would like to also ask you, some people mentioned uh, an interest in seeing your slides, and if you could, if you could post those as a comment to mm -hmm. the Meetup page on which sure. your talk has been announced, that would be great. If you have any trouble, let me know. Um, and, and then the final question I would like to ask you, and I think we'll, in the interest of time, we'll probably have to adjourn at least officially after uh, maybe this question and if there's one or two follow-ups, but, uh, but how else can this, this, uh, this technique or this research be applied? What is the broader application? Have you given any thought to outside of Major League Baseball, how can this be used? It's a great question. Yeah, Elliot, I'm glad you bring that up because this is an important point. <clears throat> Certainly, I'm applying these ideas to MLB base, baseball, but let, let's get general for a second. Um, what we're essentially doing is we're using a recurrent neural network to model survival analysis quantities. Um, there, there's kind of an initial paper where all of these ideas were proposed, and in that paper, they do also talk about um, kind of tricks and techniques you can use to, to work with both uncensored and censored data. Th this problem is only working with uncensored data, uh, but there are a lot of problems where you would want to use survival analysis. You want to use a time to event modeling framework. Um, I mean, let's just talk about some examples. We talked about some clinical, um, clinical examples. In sports, a lot of times they use um, survival analysis to model the time to an injury. In business, you might want to use the, the, the model, rather the time um, to reach out to a, a new customer. How long has it been where the relationship is starting to go stale? Um, there's, I mean, numerous applications of survival analysis and what this um, neural network approach does is it gives you a modeling approach with no distributional assumptions. Um, it allows you to take the, the time dependent features into account and uh, you can use still use both censored and uncensored data to fit those models. So um, essentially this is an improved version in some use cases for uh, general survival analysis problems. Thank you, Colin. Thomas, are there maybe one or two other questions that we can address, and then we could probably call it quits. While you're looking at that, I want to take take a moment to recognize the people who have asked questions, and I want Colin you to be aware uh, of the impressive set of people who have asked these questions. So these are some people who are very well qualified in the area of data science, and the fact that they're taking a real interest in what you're presenting is yet another indicator of uh, the pertinence of your, your topic and the quality of your presentation. So I want to thank Thomas Winandy, Michael Bloom, Julian Carrasquillo, Michael Fortman, um, Andrew, whose last name I don't know, and Steve Poling, all of whom, um, with the exception of Andrew, who I haven't had the chance to meet yet, um, I, I know uh, have uh, a lot of experience in education in this field. So thanks, gentlemen and uh, ladies, and uh, also Amanda Jenkins. I think I saw you pipe up there um, with one or, one or two questions. So thank you, members, for those interesting questions. And Thomas, are there one or two final questions that we can end with? Looks like we got one final question uh, from Andrew. He's asking why use survival analysis? It seems like whenever the recurrent network spikes above 0.3, you predict he'll be pulled. Am I missing something? Does the survival analysis feed into the recurrent network? Good question, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it would be right to assume that we're, we're using, um, you know, the, the, we're basically using the predictions similarly to how we would 
in um, in a regular binary classification problem. I guess we're we're using this LSTM pivot survival analysis framework because um, the the I, I did a okay so I presented this as a binary classification problem, but it's I would call it a special case where uh, for each outing we know exactly what um, the the response variable is going to look like right the, the pitcher always has an at bat you know a, a number of at bats where they're not pulled and then a final one where they're, they are pulled if we're thinking just about the data it's a vector with zero 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 then a one at the very end um, so this this itself lends itself to a time to event modeling framework so as we use the the recurrent neural network to model the um, conditional hazard rate uh, we're, we're we basically unlock all those other survival analysis quantities. We can calculate the survival um, the survival rate, and there are a couple other quantities that that pop up a lot in survival analysis. And in particular, we could not do this if um, if it was a, a say a regular binary classification problem where in any given game the pitcher gets removed during some at bats and he gets stayed during other at bats. You know, if there were zeros and ones kind of mixed in there in the response variable. So uh, really, it's it's. It's a function of um, maybe the um, the way that the pro the problem is set up, the way that the data uh, looks. I'd say. Okay. Thank you. Gentlemen, yeah. gentlemen, with that, we'll probably have to to uh, draw this to a close given the time. Uh, but I want to give Tuvi, Thomas, and David an opportunity to make any announcements that might be pertinent to the community at large. Uh, is there anything that folks should know going forward into August uh, and or September, uh, Tuvi? Yeah, so uh, just wanted to give my thanks uh, to Colin and to you, Elliot, for uh, moderating. And thank you, um, Thomas, for providing the technical support. Thanks, David. And also to our attendees um, for dialing in remotely through uh, Slack and through YouTube Live. I really appreciate that. Uh, so September, as some of you might already know, we are doing our uh, the, the virtual version of Big Data Ignite, also the also known as the Big Data Ignite uh, webinar series. And it's the goal is to have 10 webinars from September 15th to October 15th. And what we are doing at this point is looking for speakers uh, with interesting topics, such as the one that Colin presented in. And uh, a format would be very similar like the one over here. But we need speakers, um, and so I would invite uh, all of the ten, all of the attendees, as you think about different topics, like Colin. Uh, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, we're uh, feverishly looking for speakers at the moment, and uh, the goal is to get the program out. Uh, so that's the that's the uh, quick announcement there. Oh, and the the deadline uh, we're trying to shoot for is the uh, the third week, actually the second week from today. So we have one more week, and then after that, we're going to sort of open it up to more contributor talks. So uh, please uh, reach out to us and uh, let us know what you have in mind. Anything is fair game from the perspective of cloud computing, data analytics, IoT, or any of the uh, pieces in between which are relevant. So looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Tuhin. David, anything? No, nothing on this end, but thanks to everybody, the speakers, uh, the attendees, and the other organizers. Thomas, any announcements? Uh, just one final thanks. Um, and another reminder, because we're doing everything live, there are, I mean, obviously the cons, the technical, I apologize again, and thank you guys for bearing with it. Uh, but the pros to it doing uh, virtual is that you guys can present anywhere you don't have to actually be in state or country. Uh, so that's a, that opens up the people who can present and that are able to, to attend as well. So other than that, I think that, I think that wraps everything up. Okay, Tom, um, Colin, uh, once again, if you can attend to the Slack channel for the next 24 hours or so to, to continue any conversations that uh, are in progress there, I think everyone would appreciate it. Um, thanks for offering to present. And with that, uh, we're done. And if I could applaud for you, if we could all applaud for you, we would. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, 